This is the Art of Darkness podcast with Kevin Kautzman and Brad Kelly. We're a couple of very online writers interested in the dark side of what drives creative people to create against all odds. This show is about art and the people who make it, what it costs them, and what it takes to bring something unique and impactful into the world. Each episode, we excavate the life and work of an artist you might think you know. Don't worry, they're all safely dead. On every episode, we try and find out just what the hell was wrong with them and how they worked through their darkness to create something that lives on after them and continues to move culture. Find us online at artofdarkpod.com and on Twitter at Art of Dark Pod. We're back. Another episode about the dark side of creativity, art of darkness. I'm Kevin Kautzman, and I'm joined today by my co-conspirator, my my roommate in the <laughs> hotel from hell uh, with the cockroaches mm-hmm. and uh, Leonard Cohen and all the rest of them, Brad <laughs> Kelly. And we hey, also have, yeah, we also have friend of the show. If you've listened to the back catalog, you, you already know who he is, Michael Backinson. Michael, Hello. how are you? I'm excellent. Really good to be here. I've been listening yeah. to your back catalog. Excellent. Yeah, good, good. Well, it's growing. It's growing, <laughs> folks. It is. And I've been thinking about how we finally have a, a show that people seem to want to listen to. We're not mm-hmm. doing Rogan numbers, but we're, we're <laughs> nobody is, listeners, though. but nobody is. Like, I don't even know if Rogan is doing Rogan numbers. Like, hey, everything, what's, what's real? Um, but, you know, people seem to, to enjoy this, the show. So based solely on that, we're going to totally change the format. For- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We yes. found something you're comfortable with and you enjoy. And now we're going to completely, uh, we're going to take a left turn at what? I guess 8th Avenue, 5th Avenue, one of the avenues. And- Between 7th and 8th, yeah. No, 7th yeah. and 8th. Yeah, okay. okay. And we are going to go to the Chelsea Hotel or Hotel Chelsea. I don't know if there's a more... Uh, I guess prestigious way of saying it, or more informed. Maybe Michael, you can you can tell us uh, that in a second. Uh, this is this is the first episode we're doing on Art of Darkness uh, about a piece of architecture, about mm-hmm. a locale, mm-hmm. and and as such, it's not going to be like the other episodes where we maybe talk about the work of an artist and how it informs their. I guess their soul or their psyche or like, you know, we try to sort of get to the bottom of what moved them. In this case, I think the question is something more like, does a place have a soul? And if so, what, what is the soul of the, the hotel Chelsea or the Chelsea hotel? Uh, Michael, which is it? Which should we say for the episode to begin? Well, I think, more people know it as the Chelsea Hotel. Like everybody talks about the Chelsea Hotel, but when you walk up on it, it says Hotel Chelsea. So officially it's Hotel Chelsea, but I'm perfectly fine calling it the Chelsea Hotel. I mean, Leonard Cohen named that famous song Mm -hmm. Chelsea Mm -hmm. Hotel, so. Yes, indeed, about uh, getting a blowy from uh, Janis Joplin. (laughs) Yes, I think I'll be uh, touching on that today. (laughs) Yeah, I remember you well in the Chelsea Hotel. You were talking so brave and so sweet, giving me head on the unmade bed while the limousines wait in the street. Indeed. Wow. Those are pretty good. Those are fun lyrics. Wow. And that, so many people have covered that song. Right. (laughs) All right. Well, so we're not going to, we're not going to sing on this episode. No. Brad Brad rapped on a Patreon episode. I did. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to listen to the, uh, that that one brought a lot of Patreon subscribers. (laughs) Rapping. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to hear Brad rap, you're going to want to subscribe to our Patreon at patreon.com slash art of dark pod. And you'll get an extra episode for every episode we do. We do these core episodes. Then we do the, dark room episodes where we have guests come on and we're going to have one of those too, but we'll talk about that later. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, and I think as, as we go on, I'll tease the after dark episode for this. I'll, I'll extract something from inside the content here and tease it a little bit as we go. I'm generally pretty good at at doing that if I may say so myself. So uh, Patreon, you gotta, you gotta get it. If only, to hear Brad rap on the MF team. <laughs> and there's lots of good, some of the best stuff in Art of Darkness is on the Patreon. Yeah, I'm we kind of, uh, we're, we're relaxed right now. Like I'm not that tense, but yeah, yeah we kind of, on the, on the After Dark, we kind of uh, let things fly a little bit yeah. more. So you yeah. know, if you're into the show, 
support the show. We put a lot of time into it. Um, all right. So I say, I say, let's, uh, let's start and maybe, uh, well, we, we usually, we start with the art of darkness question, which yeah. is for Brad Kelly in this case, I think, because yeah. Michael, I want you to go second because you know a lot more about the Ch- uh, Chelsea hotel than Brad does. So Brad, mm-hmm. what do you know about the hotel Chelsea? I don't know a ton. I learned a little bit just um, kind of scouring the Wikipedia page for notable residents uh, to tweet about in the run up to this episode at twitter.com slash art of dark pod. Yeah. You know, I use, I post to like sort of one tweet kind of episodes almost of art of darkness. Um, So I was doing notable residents of the Chelsea hotel and learned mostly about who lived there and it's basically everybody so uh, (laughs) i lived in new york for seven years i never even visited i feel like a clown right and i i feel like i should maybe go back and move and live there right just for Mm. a little bit just pick up some of the soak up some of the the juju that's in that place Mm. uh but yeah it's a it's a obviously in new york city uh, uh call it a hotel but people had you know people lived there for extended periods of time sometimes years and years uh, everybody from Mark Twain to Sid Vicious lived in this place. Uh, oh, and, and I think I have the After Dark story. The After Dark ooh. story is going to be about this man who lived to be the oldest man uh, yeah. at the time. Yes. So we'll talk about that fellow on the After Dark episode. Very, he lived to be I, 102 years old in the Chelsea Hotel. Yeah, and when he died, wow. he was the oldest man in the world, right? The oldest yeah. man in the world yeah. lived yeah. in this hotel, Crazy. among all these yeah. others that you're talking right. about. Right, right, right. So, so uh, for whatever reason, I mean, I think there's probably a lot of buildings in New York City that have had notable, a lot of notable residents, but I, I think this has got to be head, shoulders, and waist above all of those places for whatever no, reason it's been. It has a to be almost historically the highest concentration of freaks. Yeah. Uh, and, well, and that's true. That's the thing. Too. It's it's, it's yeah. eccentric people. It's it's you know it's a lot of artists um, of all stripes, film film music writers, yeah. you know, everybody. It's like the firehouse and Ghostbusters, but instead of capturing ghosts, <laughs> it captures people with daddy issues. <laughs> yeah. So that's about all I know about it. I mean. Uh, yeah, it's I'm, I'm hyped to do this because yeah. I want to figure out I want to answer Kevin's or try to answer Kevin's question. What is the deal with this place? What is the deal? And I already had the idea. There's the, this sort of strange duality about the place. Hotel Chelsea, Chelsea Hotel. Mm-hmm. We'll get into it shortly. The history of it. Uh, it started as a kind of almost like a communal apartment living co it was the first co-op in mm-hmm. New York City at the time so it's impo- it's impossible to imagine New York City without apartments now so huh. it was groundbreaking even then we'll get into it but i want to give michael a chance cuz i know michael you have a something like a relationship with the place it sounds like you visit there you maybe even have friends who have lived there yeah what do you know about the chelsea hotel in five minutes. <laughs> right. So, um, yeah, I, I was actually surprised when I uh, was looking into it that it was a, a co-op. And what a co-op to me means, at least in terms of New York real estate, was that it was it was something that could be bought. You, you could buy into it. Like you could buy shares into it. And it was specifically designed from the beginning for artists. Um, that was the idea, was to attract artists to this place. What at the time, go wrong? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but at the time, that was the theater district. The theater district has migrated in New York over time. Um, it, at one point, it was like below Astor Place. Astor Place is around like 8th Street. At that time, that was around 23rd. It kept moving north. Now, of course, Times Square is what we think of with, uh, with Broadway. But hmm. at that time, it was a theater district. Um, yeah, no, I mean, Mike, I've lived in the city for on and off for 20 something years. So I, I was familiar with it and was kind of in awe of it when I went by. I didn't know all the people that had lived there, but I'd, I'd heard about it. Um, so, it's you know, you see all of these plaques festooning it like, you know, like a, <laughs> like, a, you know, a, what a, sol- a yeah, Russian like soldier would have on the yeah, yeah exactly sure, all yeah. that's and the you know fake uh, uh, awards that you have on your chest, um, <laughs> but these are you know actual legends that that live there at mm-hmm. some point. Um, but yeah, my personal connection is uh, by hook or by crook. My my uh, wife made uh, friends with this guy who's a hairstylist um, who did stuff for movies and just cut hair as well. Um, 
also a visual artist. So she was going to him for years. So I, I got to meet him and got to know him. And then eventually I figured I'd spring and spend the extra money for a better haircut. And so I've, I've been going there for a while for haircuts up on the 10th floor. Um, and also where I produce music is just a couple of blocks uh, down to the west at the London Terrace uh, Hotel, or and London now, Terrace Towers. And now yeah. this, this is the fellow that we're hoping to have on for the Dark Room episode. Yeah, he's very into it. He's never done okay. Zoom. He says he's a, uh, uh, you know, a bit of a Luddite, but uh, he, he'll, he'll get on there and um, tell you about it. He's lived there since the mid-90s. Perfect. Wow. So what a, a fun thing we get to do here. We get to make Gerald, this episode. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gerald DeCock is his name. Okay. And if you, if you look yeah. him up, you will find all kinds of profiles because his studio space is unique. Okay. Very Brilliant. cool. Yeah. So not only do we get to wander through the historic uh, Hotel Chelsea, we actually get to have a resident come on and talk with us at, in the, uh, the dark room. So that's great. We got we to get around to booking that too here. But mm -hmm. um, Well, I think that was a, a protracted intro, but this is a big subject with so much going on. So um, let's just dig into it. I want to read some stuff. Um, to give us a little bit of context, uh, I'm going to read from the, this is an article from Vanity Fair. I'm going to read a few paras of this. Oh, I have a couple of books, a couple of volumes. Um, I spent a lot of, a lot more time online than I did in these books, but I got, uh, one book's called this ain't no holiday Inn: down and out at the Chelsea hotel, <laughs> 1980 through 1995. It's got this, you know, cover looking kind of. I guess, sultry, kind of a <laughs> noir vibe. And that's uh, by James Lowe. And then uh, I got a book by a woman named Cheryl Tippins called Inside the Dream Palace, The Life and Times of New York's Legendary Chelsea Hotel. I'm only going to pull a few things from these, but they were my kind of bigger references. Like I said, I spent a lot of uh, time online for this. Um, yeah. Surprisingly, there's not a ton of great con like video content. If you go on YouTube, hmm. there's, there's like a kind of a tour that, that some guy gives for the BBC, uh, which is okay. Um, you could try to watch the, the Warhol film, Chelsea Girls, but I don't think you're going to get <laughs> much uh, in terms of like the Chelsea Hotel out of that. We'll, we'll talk about that at some point. Um, there is a, a, a good interview online with Patty Smith talking about uh, meeting Robert Maplethorpe, but that's, that's all sort of around it, you know? So mm -hmm. it's, it, 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 there's, it's pretty thin on YouTube, which was surprising. However, a lot of ink has been spilled by a lot of different people about the Chelsea Hotel. This place has like a, like a quality that just makes people want to, it seems it makes them want to make stuff write stuff and like write about it and talk about it. It has an effect on people. So that's maybe something to kind of put in your pocket and think about. Um, so I'm going to read a little bit from this Vanity Fair article. Uh, and it's going to start in the present and then I want to go back. Um, so today the halls of the Chelsea Hotel are stalled with dust or rather salted with dust. The hundreds of paintings that adorned its walls have been locked away in storage. The doors to abandoned apartments are whitewashed and padlocked. Hotel operations ceased in 2011 for the first time in 106 years. And now the few remaining residents from the echoing, uh, uh, roam the echoing corridors like ghosts. They have watched workers haul out antique moldings, stained glass, even entire walls. Ancient pipes ruptured during renovations, flooding apartments, and neighbors returned home from work to find their front doors sealed in plastic wrap. The Chelsea's new owners say that the building had fallen into dangerous disrepa uh, disrepair, and they are restoring it to its original condition. Some residents believe that they are being forced out, and that the Chelsea, as they know it, and as it was known to residents from Sherwood Anderson and Thomas Wolfe to Sid Vicious and Jasper Johns, will soon vanish before the city's merchant greed. Dystopia Utopias always begin as utopias, and the Chelsea is no different. And so that's that's coming from around um, 2011. And so going on in the same article, uh, this is going to take us back in time. So let's situate ourselves uh, around the 1870s, and I'm going to read on. Though in its current state, it bears an unfortunate resemblance to Los Angeles's Bradbury building as transfigured in Blade Runner, the Chelsea was originally conceived as a socialist utopian commune. Its architect, Philip, Philip Hubert, 
was raised in a family devoted to the theories of the French philosopher Charles Fourier, who proposed the construction of self-contained settlements that would meet every possible professional and personal need of its inhabitants. After the stock market crash of 1873, Hubert decided New York was ready for its own Fourierian experiment and devised a plan to build cooperative apartment houses in New York City. Tenants would save money by sharing fuel and ser services. Hubert's creations, New York City's first co-ops, were tremendously successful, and none more so than the Chelsea, which opened in 1884. Keeping with Fourier's philosophy, Hubert reserved apartments for the people who built the building, the, the electricians, construction workers, interior designers, and plumbers. Hubert surrounded these laborers with writers, musicians, and actors. The top floor was given over to 15 artist studios. Hudson River School paintings hung in the common dining rooms, and the hallways and ceilings were decorated with natural motifs. At 12 stories, the Chelsea was the tallest building in New York which uh, is just sort of incredible. Wow. Man. <laughs> yeah, but here, here we go, right? So flash forward, best laid plans. Hubert's grand experiment went bankrupt in 1905 yeah. and the Chelsea was converted to a luxury hotel. Mm. So it reopened as a hotel. Uh, then the hotel went bankrupt <laughs> and it was purchased in 1939 by Joseph Gross, Julius Krauss, and David Bard. And these partners managed the hotel together until the early 1970s. Now the, the heyday, like the, well, it feels kind of like the heyday for the Chelsea Hotel is the 60s and the 70s somehow. I don't know why necessarily, but it, it feels that way. And I think, I think partly that's because this fellow, Stanley Bard, David Bard's son, became the manager of the hotel. And we're going to come back all the way around to him, um, you know, at the end of this uh, episode, uh, because he he was around for a good long while until this recent shakeup that happened with the uh, with the hotel. Um, and when he took over in 1970, like in the in the 70s, he really leaned into the uh, well, the freak show. <laughs> he really? He, and he's fun. You can find in that BBC documentary that I, that I mentioned, which is on YouTube. Just look up Chelsea Hotel. It'll be their BBC documentary. Uh, you know, he's, he's there and he's just like, you know, I really believe in, in meeting my tenants where they are and helping them out. So this was the guy who would kind of like into the 70s and, and the 80s, he'd kind of like let things slide. But we'll, we'll mm. meet him a little further down the line because I do sort of want to remain chronological. Um, so I don't know, Michael, do you, uh, you know, in your, in your looking into this, did you learn much about Mark Twain uh, and, and his visit to the Chelsea? No, I, I, I just see a reference to that. But, uh, you know, I've seen Mark Twain is listed as living in about three dozen places. I think yeah. he bounced around. He definitely well, did. He, he, he was a kind of almost like the first stand-up comedian. He did uh, these public speaking tours that took him to every single last place. Yeah. Yeah. His yeah. level of fame was uh, astronomical, Elvis level fame before yeah. Elvis. Um, although there was nobody like Elvis. Yeah, well, I mean, given Mark Twain's timeline, he may have been there during the commune days. Mm -hmm. it's, Twain right, died it's in 1910, possible. I believe. So, mm. yeah. Well, and I think we've got to pause and – well, I think it would have been a hotel by then. Okay. Um, you know, the, the irony, of course, right? We're, we're going to start this great socialist commune, and then it becomes a hotel. The hotel goes bankrupt, and then it becomes just this um, – <laughs> it's just these apartments. Um, but it's – I think it's worth pausing uh, the three of us for a second just to consider what a radical idea this would have been. I mean, I'm reading here on the Wikipedia – uh, you know, within, within a few years, the combination of economic stresses, the suspicions of New York's middle class about apartment living, the <laughs> opening up of Upper Manhattan and the plentiful supply of houses there, and the relocation of the city's theater district bankrupted the Chelsea. Right. So all these factors, this location it's kind of cursed. Right, <laughs> right. Like, right. Yeah. I, I like this idea of, of people being skeptical of apartment living. What, what do you mean? They're all just going to live in the same building together? <laughs> like, <laughs> It sounds a little bit like communism to me. <laughs> I, you know, I mean, now we can't imagine it any other way, could we? Yeah, 
No. You, what, no, what do you mean? I'm gonna. My son's <laughs> gonna go live with other men in <laughs> this giant building. Right. I mean, it, but this narrative, you know, you talk. We're talking about the middle class suspicion of this. I mean, what's one of the finest uh, pejoratives that's been uh, sort of created online? People, you're a bug man. Yeah. People call people bug men. So there's right. there's still this sort of living in the pod. Yeah. Living in the pot. Yeah. So, well, I don't, I don't know what I have to contribute about that, <laughs> contribute to that, but um, yeah. uh, something, something to think about. How, what a what, radical change that, you know, this, this represented. Yeah. 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 And the fact that it's the lar- the tallest building in New York city is hard for me to even, even fathom. I mean, yes. Yeah. Very well, it was, it was built in a style that they describe as Queen Anne revival and Victorian Gothic among its distinctive features are the delicate flower ornamented iron balconies on its facade, which almost mm-hmm. kind of evoke like a new Orleans mm-hmm. kind of a vibe. Don't they? Mm-hmm. They're beautiful. Yeah. Are they? I love the iron work. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then this grand staircase, which extends upward 12 fo- floors. So that like, like, is mm-hmm. very uh, impressive. And you, mm-hmm. and it's kind of freaky because you can look down straight from the top all the way down to the lobby, essentially. Uh, it's yeah. just a, if you misstepped or, you know, intentionally did that, <laughs> it'd be quite a fall. Yeah. Well, I mean, and if you were like, uh, oh, what was his name? One of the playwrights that lived there uh, would, would like to get drunk and he would like to yell up the staircase and everything. <laughs> that kind of, not that I would relate at all to that, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, so that's very interesting. Uh, so yeah, I feel like we're, hopefully that paints a little bit of a picture of the place and I, I just want to now, in terms of the, the structure of the episode, Michael and I are going to go back and forth a little bit. And I think we just, I think we want to do what everybody uh, kind of wants to do when you talk about the Chelsea Hotel, which is we're going to go kind of in a funny way. We're not going to cover everybody because it too would just, people. too many people. I mean, yeah. if Brad started a thread about all the famous people, it'd be hundreds of be you could probably reach a thousand people who are notable in some way. Uh, yeah, I, I think I think I cherry picked like thirty maybe mm-hmm. for those that that run of tweet that run of tweets. So yeah, there's yep. and that was just scratching the surface. So, well, there's a restaurant in the hotel as well called El Quixote, which <laughs> this is crazy. Uh, it was in the hotel uh, from 1930 and was in the same family from 1930 until 2017, uh, this restaurant. So just to set you in this place, and there are just not many places, certainly not in North America, that are, that are like this. There's no other place that's like this. It is a unique place. Uh, so, yeah, I want to start with an anecdote um, about uh, <laughs> Jackson Pollock. So... Let me pull this up here. Um, yeah, Jackson Pollock was introduced to the swells. He was being sort of uh, brought out by the uh, by Peggy Guggenheim for uh, to to be you know to be shown as a as an artist. And I'm I'm looking for this uh, this anecdote. Uh, well, you know, I can I can recount it from memory. So. Uh, you have to imagine J- uh, Jackson Pollock in the 40s. Uh, I imagine in the restaurant here, or po- probably in a, it would actually, probably, I'm sure, would have been private with Peggy Guggenheim, right? Mm-hmm. She's going to introduce this this next great hot artist to the uh, to to the money, and uh, he proceeded to to throw up uh, his his liquid lunch. You know, you're right. you're th- you're you're getting some olives in you anyway. Yeah, <laughs> three Manhattan lunch. <laughs> And one of the one of the would be patrons uh, suggested that that uh, the waiter or someone else take the cutting of the carpet because it would be worth a lot of money in the future. Oh my god! Because <laughs> <laughs> it looks like his it paintings. looks like a Pollock. It's a it's a Pollock original. Yeah. <laughs> so there's no three act structure to that story no. for Jackson Pollock, no. but I think that's a good. Thing to, a good anecdote to start with. That's the kind of thing that's going to happen at the Chelsea right. Hotel, and a lot worse. Mm-hmm. Some really, this is about darkness. There's some really bad things that happen to this hotel, and uh, you know, I imagine it infuses the the memory of the place. Mm-hmm. So that was in the '40s, uh, and now I want to hand it over to Michael because sure. in the '50s, uh, Dylan Thomas 
the the poet very famously uh, lived there. So, Michael, what do you what do you have for us about about Dylan Thomas's time at the Chelsea? Yeah, so he was actually there at least two times. Um, you know, he was a famous Welsh poet uh, who had captured the imagination of the literary world and was becoming kind of a pop star as well. You know, you mentioned Mark Twain. Well, he was engaged to come to America in 1952 to go and do tours around college campuses and, and you know, hobnob with the literati. So that's when he first went there. He brought his wife with him that time, Caitlin. Um, they had an extremely rocky relationship, um, to say the least. But she came with him that time, and they stayed at the the Chelsea Hotel whenever they were in New York. But they were, of course, were bouncing all around um, the country. That's when I think he recorded uh, uh, his own poems that were then sold as like I th- they were they sold quite well as records. Um, I remember my mom had a, a, a vinyl LP of of his stuff that we listened to as kids. Um, But the famous uh, time is when he comes back about a year and a half later in the fall of 53. And he was sort of in this place where he felt he had lost his poetic mojo um, and he didn't know he was ever going to get it back. And he was kind of just in despair of having lost the muse. He was more or less estranged from his wife. Um, somehow the plane tickets got messed up and he ha- showed up like a week later than he was supposed to. Somehow he was a drunk. <laughs> he was a really drunk. <laughs> Their alcohol had something to do with it as well. So he, yeah, he was in a, a horrible place when he uh, landed at Idlewild. Um, he was picked up by, uh, find the name of this woman, because she factors heavily. Liz Rytel was kind of his tour guide around the city and was arranging everything for him. And, and she, of course, had kind of an affair with him mm-hmm. and stayed with him at the Chelsea Hotel. So that's where he landed and he bounced around. Um, he was there to sell Adventures in the Skin Trade, which was his new novel. And then he was also developing Under Milkwood for possibly a commercial run, maybe on Broadway, maybe in London, mm-hmm. something like that. And he was having rehearsals with actors. But, and he was also supposed to perform in it himself. But he was just an absolute train wreck. I mean, I just reread this uh, chapter about, you know, basically the final days of his life. Which, which is the biography. Let's uh, create Yeah, this. so this is called Dylan Thomas, A New Life by Andrew Lysette. Um, and uh, I, we respect our biographers on this show. A very yeah, great deal. absolutely. We corrected yeah. that we're not doing biographies. We're yes. doing profiles. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there you go. The great Carl Rollison. <laughs> Uh, but a friend of mine, Jim Nabel, asked me to portray Dylan Thomas in a workshop of a musical a few years ago. So I bought this book and it, it was it blew me away, um, you know, what it, what had gone on with him. I, I could see that work. You're like a handsome Dylan Thomas a little bit. You got a little <laughs> bit of a handsome. Well, he, he was, you know. We don't he, want to cast the ugly He had Dylan no problem Thomas with the. Uh, what do you think show business I'm, is, bro? I'm just <laughs> saying Michael is very handsome and he could pull off Dylan Thomas. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. There yeah. you go. Uh, but he had his way with the ladies. Women were entranced with him. But at this point, my God, he was 38 when he arrived. He yeah. turned 39 there and was uh, dead within a couple of weeks. You know, I'm reading, uh, I don't want to steal, steal, stomp on this, but I'm reading, yeah. uh, preparing for the John Berryman episode. Oh, John yeah. Berryman was born in the same year as Dylan Thomas. And when he met him uh, near around Cambridge someplace, Jer- John Berryman almost had he had an existential crisis realizing how accomplished and famous Dylan Thomas was, and they were the same age. Where John Berryman was in graduate school at Cambridge, right? And he was like, "Oh my God, this guy's the exact same age as I am." <laughs> <laughs> There's a wonderful uh, anecdote about him in there when he learns the news that Dylan had died, and he was oh, just, okay. or he was he had been hospitalized, and he was up forget what college he was at. It was like Bard or something like that. He was somewhere upstate and he was walking around in a, in a total panic, taking deep breaths. And he explained that he was taking extra breath for Dylan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's, that sounds uh, right. That sounds right. And that is why we're doing this episode. <laughs> anecdotes like that. 100%. So, um, just to kind of, so he was spending all of his time at the at the Chelsea Hotel and bouncing around with these different things. He uh, was at an event that Arthur Miller was at, another sort of post-death um, uh, comment that Arthur Miller had was like, he just, he couldn't reconcile it that this young man was that 
close to death. And he was like, if he'd, if he'd just abstained for one week, he would have been as health, healthy as a pig. Um, <laughs> but again, it came down to this thing of, you know, what was it, what was driving him to drink so much besides just, you know, the disease of alcoholism? It was just like, there was something. Oh, yeah, he's cutting out. Well, yeah, that's, that's right. right. We can kill the video and uh, yeah. pick it up. It's like, that's, I mean, mm -hmm. it's like a lot of, it's like a lot of, poets i mean talking about john berryman john berryman was a raging alcoholic at this same time and it's a sort of a yeah uh, i don't know much about dylan thomas but it does seem like sensitivity of a certain kind mm. is, is part of this there's um, also simply a genetic predisposition there is i mean yeah. if you yeah yeah but yeah. It, it, if you combine that with the the sensitivity and then also people who maybe shouldn't be traveling so much they should maybe be staying home with their wives uh right. by the fireplace well, and not tra yeah traveling yeah. is is traveling wrecks you for sure mm -hmm. right i mean mm -hmm. you, you eat poorly you, you you can drink too much you can it's 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 a challenge especially a guy you know imagine if you'd been uh famous touring artist in your mid 20s Kevin well and the amount of the amount of pressure uh, that you're under I, I see Michael is back I did yeah. notice that he uh, that he had a cat crawling around on the that's uh, true the, so <laughs> it was there was the kitten was the cat responsible for this Michael one hundred percent I took your advice to uh, to plug in you know not use the Wi-Fi yeah so uh, she came right up and pulled the USB uh, the, oh, yeah. Thing oh, right yeah. out. That doesn't surprise me. <laughs> oh, where, where was I? Just when I thought I was out, they pull me back in. <laughs> Years of podcasting. <laughs> oh my god. Well, yeah. okay, we're back. Well, we were uh, talking about Dylan Thomas and, and sort of and Kevin and I kind of vamped a little bit about just alcohol and poets and, and things. Yeah. <laughs> So what was driving him to this? I mean, uh, he, he was estranged from his wife. Uh, he felt that he'd lost his muse. She had sent him some telegram that said, you have left me no choice but suicide or the street. Hate, Caitlin. Hate instead of love, Caitlin. Oh, whoa. Ow. Yeah. Um, and he was having these various affairs, and, and he had a premonition of his death. I mean, he was, he was frightened of it, but he was being drawn towards it. He would tell people, just strangers, he's like, I, I had... A, I had a vision last night of the gates of hell, you know, it, it, and he, he saw a poster of Tony Curtis in some Houdini movie and it like struck him to the core because oh. somehow he associated himself with Houdini and he was like, this is a sign. And then he was, he was going around in the village and uh, he, he, this is, yeah. We, and he's Welsh. And yeah. so yeah. not from, I mean, what, was he from a village or was he from a city himself or was he? He was from uh, Swansea. He, he lived in, um, he, he, yeah, he very much identified as Welsh. Um, he, I'm just thinking yeah. it's a long way from, from Swansea to New York city and the yeah. New York city. Wow. Yeah. yeah that, but mm -hmm. he, he, you know, he'd lived in London. He was celebrated, but he could never hold on to money. He could never have a real job. It, his wife was basically like, they, they, they were struggling to survive, even though he was like this legendary figure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then um, he, he kept going back to this White Horse Tavern. Uh, I was his there. pub. Yeah. Have you? I was heard, I've oh, heard yeah. of the White Horse Tavern. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah quite and a he, famous little literary haunt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he famously came back and said that he had had 18 whiskeys in a row. Um, and it was and a record. Yeah, and that it was a record. Yeah, mm -hmm. it must be a record. Um, but that is belied by the fact that he was being followed by detectives because there was a libel suit between him and Time Magazine. So they were following him, and they said that he hadn't had more than six. But he had been prescribed uh, essentially amphetamines by this woman, Liz's doctor, uh, who was also administering to him whatever sort of some sort of steroid shots he was just you know he was having kind of a quack doctor pump him full of I, stuff i love that he this this poet from wales lands in new york city already famous he's got he's got his girl to go live in sin in the uh the apartment that the middle class didn't didn't respect mm -hmm. and he's got a plug <laughs> he already has his doctor <laughs> yep. feel good yep. this first thing yeah Oof. Uh. So, yeah. so, so there's some kind of multi-drug toxicity happening. Mm. Well, plus you said he was in very poor health anyway. 
anyway. Yeah, I mean, poor mental health. Um, who knows? And and Arthur Miller was probably right. You know, if he had sobered up, he probably would have been okay. But this doctor was giving him these drugs on top of a heavy imbibing. Um, I had thought that that night of the 18 drinks was like the night that he died. But that was sort of like what pushed him over the edge in that the next day he was supposed to he was supposed to hang out with a friend, go over to New Jersey and, and spend time with him. And he canceled that. And then sometime the next evening, he fell into a coma. Oof. It was the thought of going over to New Jersey that, that <laughs> <laughs> exactly. had to do it. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, so then he was taken to the hospital and the, the word went out to all kinds of people that he was, you know, on his deathbed. He never, he never was lucid again after that. Uh, his wife flew in. She was able to see him. Um, she, you know, was totally distraught, but she flew into such a, 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 a panic that she jumped on his bed and was trying to kiss him and hug him. And the nurses dragged her away and then committed her to Bellevue. And oh. yeah. And then she was uh, whisked away to some other uh, institute. So she missed him um, dying. But I believe that it was Berryman who was, who was there and witnessed his last breath. Wow, I'm not that, mistaken. That could, that could be. Well, yeah. and it's it's occurring to me as we do this episode that we're not going to have the opportunity to give the full art of darkness treatment to anyone. Yeah, who's correct. correct. Yeah. We're trying to figure out the hotel, but yeah. these are all figures that at some point we're going to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a long time. Uh, yeah. But yeah, what a fascinating story. And so he he drank at the White Horse. He was being followed uh, by these uh, uh, Pinkertons or whatever these these men. Um, they, they were doing a little reconnaissance because he was. I guess he had some libel suit versus time, and uh, they wanted to prove that he was maybe an unreliable narrator. Ah, <laughs> yeah, ha, ha, yeah. Ha. Well, and and then so he 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 did manage to make his way back to the hotel, and he just died. He uh, made his way back to the hotel. He he sur you know he was alive for another day, but it, it had just been like this accumulation of things. Um, and they said like once he whether this is true or not, it's hard to pin it down. But once he received that telegram, he was just on a an epic bender like you can't believe. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it took its toll. Interestingly enough, when they did the autopsy, uh, his liver was not as damaged as they thought. What he'd actually really messed up was his lungs from lots of uh, smoking. Hmm. And then the doctor had prescribed morphine on top of all these things, and it had suppressed his lungs. So it's like emphysema plus uh, the suppression uh, of the lung function kind of put him into a coma. But the alcohol had also really affected his brain and spinal fluids. Um, so the doctors, the, the famous line was that the doctors called it an insult to the brain. Yeah, yeah, wow. Wow. Imagine... I, I, having to committed that much damage to your body by the age of 38 i mean that's fairly it's not young young but it's certainly not it's, an old man it's time to the air guitar. Wow, yeah. Rock and roll. Yeah, we're going. yeah yeah no yeah. it's actually not great we should no. i shouldn't no, yeah it's but, terrible you got to take care of yourself whew. yeah but yeah. he did look he burned bright this guy he clearly he, he got he it done he yeah. uh, he left a legacy of writing but definitely Look out for yourself there. I, I just saw a thing, two things on this. I want to know, just looking at Wikipedia that kind of jumped out at me. One, he apparently was only, he only had 100 pounds when he died. That was the, the, yeah, the value was the, of his estate. Correct. Which is amazing because, you know, he's, he, was, he, was, he was a famous figure in this, in this world for sure. Mm. And that his widow died in 1994. Mm -hmm. And she was a, a bad alcoholic as well, but she really? kind of pulled herself together and I think was sober for the last few years of her life. And she remarried some Italian guy. Yeah. Um, wow. Wow. Fast. That telegram is one of the most savage. <laughs> it is. Hate. Little, that's a great tweet. I'm yeah. going to read it again. <laughs> you have left me no choice but suicide or the street. Hate Caitlin. Hate Caitlin. Ooh. And it even has a, a little bit of a, there's a little, little poetry. A little bit, a bit of a poem to it. Yes. Yeah. Well, she, yeah. you know, she had three kids and he was just not supporting her. You know, he was yeah. gallivanting around and she was, you know, left sure. in the lurch. Hmm. I thought that we could read, I'm going to read one of his poems and then I'm going to move on. Uh, unless Michael, do you have anything else uh, to say uh, about, about, uh, well, the only th Dylan other Thomas. thing that I would say, some, some, I forget who said this. They said that in some ways, maybe he was punishing himself because his father was also daddy issues. Yeah. His father was also kind of uh, an artistic type, but had been, you know, had died in obscurity. And it was almost mm -hmm. like he was paying 
taking out it out on himself that his father hadn't enjoyed the same success oh, that he had. Dang. Mm. Hmm. Yeah, this hmm. is the thing about all this psych, uh, psychologizing, uh, psychologizing that people do, and like we find ourselves doing it on this show as it, well. It's hard. It's hard not to sometimes, you know. You really get this question mark of like, why is he doing that? This, you know. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hey, that was a, a, a great little mini profile of yeah. Dylan Thomas and how he ended up dead in the Chelsea hotel. I, we may have a, an episode titled night of the 18 drinks at the Chelsea hotel <laughs> is not so bad. Um, we'll, we'll see what else this episode gives us. Um, I'm going to read one of his poems. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And death shall have no dominion dead men naked. They shall be one with a man in the wind and the West moon. When their bones are picked clean and the clean bones gone, they shall have stars at elbow and foot. Though they go mad, they shall be sane. Though they sink through the sea, they shall rise again. Though lovers be lost, love shall not, and death shall have no dominion. Hmm. That's a banger. That is. That is a banger. That's a banger. And I imagine you could find, because he did recordings and things, I imagine you could probably find him reading that. in a. It, it would yeah. probably be a much better rendition than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it would uh, be less sober and more Welsh, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and apparently the, the title comes from St. Paul's Epistle to the Romans, and death shall have no dominion. Okay. Yeah, great. Okay. So we're, you know, that, that, that happened in 1953. Am I correct? Uh, Dylan That's Dylan. right. He had just turned 39. Yeah. So we're, we're out of the war. Uh, you know, war is over. And now we're getting into the, I guess, uh, I, the, uh, the age of the American empire, right? And the, the post-war period. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, Arthur C. Clarke and the writing of 2001 a space odyssey now if i'm not mistaken one of the one of the plaques at hotel chelsea is for arthur c clark and That's i think right. it has i think it has hal on it which i don't know why you would do that <laughs> it, it looks like an old fashioned ipod it's it, it's yeah. Yeah. i was like why is there an ipod up there i was like oh that's hal yeah yeah i'm not sure that i love that choice um yeah, I actually want to. I'm just going to see if I can find the plaque. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah Hell's. I mean, it's it's it. It is a good character, though, right? I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah. It's a bit of an odd choice, right? You know, I don't know if I, <laughs> maybe one of the maybe one of the spacemen instead. Yeah, yeah, yeah something like that. Yeah, kind of reminds me of when you see the Cthulhu plushies. Can you imagine having just like a hell, hell plushie? <laughs> I, again, I think that's your iPhone, Brad. Yeah. I, think that you, I think your hell plushie is your iPhone. That's about right. Yeah. Well, and so it just says, you know, uh, uh, Sir, uh, Sir Arthur C. Clarke invented communication satellites in 1945. His exploration of space, 1952, was used by, uh, is it Weber? can't read the Werner von Braun. These are not easy to read um, to convince president John F. Kennedy to go to the moon. And he wrote 2001, a space odyssey here at the Chelsea hotel. And then underneath it has, it has Hal and it says, I'm sorry, Dave, I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Who decided on that? <laughs> like, I wonder what, do you think that they, they must've had a, had a sense of humor about it. They must've sort of known yeah. that they were being cute. Yeah. yeah oh sure. my gosh. It, yeah. it, uh, it's so interesting. Is is that a, a vibe, um, Michael? Kind of generally about the hotel is like because in this in this BBC doc, I noticed I noticed a lot of like there's a sense of wit among the mm -hmm. people. Oh, there's another um, little short clip you can find of Burroughs with mm -hmm. um, uh, with Andy Warhol, and it's like every word they're trying to top each other in some hyper witty way yeah and it's like it's it's like you're dipping into an in joke that's going to last an hour and it's just them around the table and they're all conscious of the camera and these are all geniuses and they're right. just they're kind of very in their heads i mean does the hotel have a vibe like that like are you aware Ooh, this is a place for artists like what does it feel when you're inside sad story is that it doesn't have that vibe anymore mm -hmm. um when that new owner took 
over. He got rid of all the paintings that had been there. Oh. Uh, he renovated everything. Uh, this endless renovation. It's like going on 11 years now. It's still uh, full of, you know, plastic wrap and this and that. And there's scaffolding outside. So I, I can't speak to who made the plaque for Arthur C. Clarke. I, I definitely, that was the vibe of the place. And the people that are still there, especially Gerald, um, have that, you know, incredible bohemian uh, sensibility. And I, I read about, you know, Patty and Robert topping each other with with stuff you know with like that but it was that was a different era and uh it's been really sanitized under this new management mm -hmm. um except for the few people that that are old longtime residents that they haven't been able to kick out mm. yeah right we're we're gonna get to that uh you know as, as we reach the end of of the core episode here and maybe talk about it a little more on the after dark for for patreon too because i'm very fascinated in if we are attempting to to scratch the surface of the story of the how the chelsea hotel um trying to paint a picture of it being this utopian commune ideal all the way through to the the recent period it's just such a fascinating uh, fascinating little reflection of america and of new york city and new york city real estate and how mm -hmm. cutthroat it is uh so i just think there's something to be said for that so we will pick that up i do want to read a little bit from something I found, um, which really uh, tickled me. Uh, if you want to go back, if you're new to Art of Darkness, this is maybe a little selfish because it's one of my episodes. Um, yeah. but, but you know what? This is a team effort. Yeah. If, if you want to go back and listen to uh, an episode that I'm proud of, listen to, listen to the Kubrick episode. Yeah. Um, it, it just it's it was so much fun to do, and of course Arthur C. Clarke was a big big part of that in in terms of Kubrick's body of work in 2001, and so. There, uh, there used to be a book that was in print, but it's not in print anymore. I found it online, and it is, uh, it is Arthur C. Clarke's diary of making 2001: A Space Odyssey and writing the book. And I, I'm just going to read a few, and you know, um, sort of entries here. Um, uh, let me just lay the table. Our initial schedule was hilarious. He's talking about working with Stanley. Our initial schedule was hilariously optimistic. Writing script, 12 weeks. Discussing it, two weeks. Revising, four weeks. Finalizing deal, four weeks. Visuals, art, 20 weeks. Shooting, 20 weeks. Cutting, editing, 20 weeks. A total of 82 weeks. Allowing another 12 weeks before release, this added up to 92, or the better part of two years. I was very depressed by this staggering period of time since I was, as always, in a hurry to get back to Ceylon. It was just as well that neither of us could have guessed the project's ultimate duration, four years. The rest mm. of 1964, this is mind-blowing to me, the rest of 1964 was spent brainstorming. <laughs> it's just you and Stanley Kubrick try to do a mel mind meld. Mm. Um, you know. And, you know, and you know Stanley Kubrick never lets you give up. Right. <laughs> he's just like, at some point you're like, Stan, Stan, literally, can we just get a sandwich? And he's, you know, <laughs> I personally know Michael and I have a mutual friend, an old timer in, in New York, uh, Lewis. Lewis, Lewis, who talks about how much he despises Kubrick because of how difficult he was to work with. They did, they did effects on 2001 and it would, it would apparently Kubrick would call at eight o'clock sharp. Eight o'clock. He was on the phone, and you'd be on the phone with him for ninety minutes, talking through what he needed and all the rest. It was just apparently really brutal to work with. But he made two thousand and one, A Space Odyssey, and some other That's good right. movies. That's so, right. so, um, <laughs> uh, so I'm going to read a few more because there's some real nuggets in here from from Arthur C. Clarke. Despite the unrelenting pressure of work, a mere 12 hours was practically a day off. I kept a detailed log of the whole operation. Though I do not wish to get bogged down in minutia of interest only to fanatical cubricologists. Oh, no. <laughs> cubricologists. <laughs> ah, what a good one. Perhaps these extracts may convey the flavor of those early days. All right, so... May 28th, 1964. And a lot of this is happening at the, um, I don't know if he's actually writing this at the Chelsea Hotel, but he would write the, he would write the thing. When he would actually buckle down to do it, he went to this place to, to do the writing, which I think is fascinating. So, um, suggested to Stanley that they might be machines who regard organic life as a hideous disease. Stanley thinks this is cute and feels we've got something. <laughs> <laughs> A couple more here. 
one hilarious idea we won't use. 17 alien, featureless black pyramids riding in open cars down Fifth Avenue, surrounded by Irish cops. <laughs> <laughs> so you want to talk about a uh, sense of humor. Here we go. July 1st, last day working at the Time Life building, uh, at Time Life completing Man in Space. Checked into new suite uh, 1008 at the Chelsea Hotel. A few more. Wow. So July 1st, he's at the uh, Hotel Chelsea, um, averaging one or 2,000 words a day. Stanley reads first five chapters and says, we've got a bestseller here. <laughs> Another one. There's so much good, interesting stuff. I'm not done. Um, July 9th, spent much of afternoon teaching Stanley how to use the slide rule. He's fascinated. <laughs> 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 okay i mean this just, it could just go on and on i like oh, this it, idea that stanley yeah. kubrick, kubrick is like he's clearly a genius but that if you give him a weird object that's like he will just go off into a you know you just ha yeah you hand him a slide rule or like uh, some odd uh mechanics tool or something and he's just going to be like you know, whenever you need a break from from writing, just hand him like a like a <laughs> socket set that he's never seen before. <laughs> I, I, I've got to read a few more of these. These are way too good not to. Uh, clear. I mean, obviously, he was a, a brilliant writer. Mm -hmm. July twelfth. Now have everything except the plot. <laughs> July thirteenth. <13th. laughs> um, got to work again on the novel and made good progress despite the distraction of the Republican convention. <laughs> July 26th, Stanley's birthday. Went to the village and found a card showing the earth coming apart at the seams and bearing the inscription, how can you have a happy birthday when the whole world may blow up any minute? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, uh, this is so interesting because this other stuff was happening. Uh, so we listen to this August 1st. The Ranger 7 impacts on, on Moon. Stay up late to watch the first TV close-ups. Stanley starts to worry about the forthcoming Mars probes. Suppose they show something that shoots down our storyline. Uh, later, he approached Lloyds of London to see if he could insure himself against this eventuality. Oh, wow. Like, what an incredible... <laughs> All right, and then I got one more. We've got the name of our hero at last. Alex Bowman. Hurrah, Alex Bowman. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, you know, it's just fun to think about these two geniuses sitting around watching, you know, different, what, I guess, moon landings. And, and uh, I don't know, was the Ranger 7? That, that would have been a probe, I think. Um, in any case, just fascinating and really, really fun stuff. Um, yeah. All happening at the Chelsea Hotel. So you want to talk about some, like, wicked contrast. You've got, I mean, we're going to come to uh, Mr. Cohen here pretty soon, who's going to write I guess a ballad about getting a getting a blowy there, and then, <laughs> and then you got these guys thinking they need to get insured by Lloyd's of London because they might start launching rockets to Mars and it blows up their plot. Just so funny. <laughs> that is the most eccentric sounding thing. Like, imagine if you weren't Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke and they weren't wildly successful, but you're just some guy and you're like, oh, you know what? I should probably go get insured in case they ruin my crappy science fiction novel. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But that's the level that they're playing at. Uh -huh, I mean, he's, yeah. he's got a four-year production that he's putting into effect. It's some, you know, and he, he, he might have been making, I don't know if it was serious. Um, in any case, uh, we're going to move on from Arthur C. Clarke, but before we do... Oh, we got to do... Uh, can, I, can I put in a little bit on Arthur C. Clarke? Yeah. So this isn't necessarily Chelsea Hotel, but I feel like you've got to tell this story. So in his later years, Arthur C. Clarke would move to Sri Lanka. And uh, Arthur C. Clarke for most of his life was a closeted homosexual, which that's, that's not really the dark thing. But him moving to Sri Lanka... Um, opened up a lot of speculation about whether or not he was a pedophile mm. um, and because he lived there for years and years and years. And there was apparently a off-the-cuff interview that, was, that circulates online that nobody can verify about him talking about this. And then, of yes. course, when the stories became sort of more widely known, he vociferously denied it. Um, so it, it's not really clear. Nobody really would know except for Arthur C. Clarke, I guess, for sure. But it's this kind of odd thing that sort of taints 
nah, I don't know if it even taints it, but it's a, it, you know, he's got all these amazing things that he did. He sort of conceptualized geostationary orbit and, right. you know, co-wrote one of the greatest science fiction masterpieces. And then like, he moved to Sri Lanka to do what exactly? Like, it's very, I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't know what to think of it. I, this is something I have. I'm glad that you circled back to this because this is something I have from the Inside the Dream Palace book. Uh, I'm going to read this. Clark was quietly but matter-of-factly bisexual. Okay. Without guilt or anxiety, he later wrote, as he had ascertained from the first of the Kinsey reports, sexual behavior in the human male, that his predispositions were st- uh, statistically normal and that we're all <laughs> polymorphously perverse, you know. What I, 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 I mean, like this that Arthur C. Clarke has to be like, look up in a table what his orientation <laughs> is. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Right. So, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, in the U.S., Clark had found the Chelsea Hotel staff as respectful of his, of his private preferences as they had been of Kerouac's and Vidal's, and he came to rely on the hotel's laissez-faire atmosphere to facilitate his creative work. So, it sounds like the, I guess, the sexual libertinism of the place, the fact that the staff doesn't, wouldn't, look at you cross-eyed mm-hmm. may have attracted him to the location, which I'm sure is, is the case for many people who yeah. don't, you know, don't fit, especially you're talking about like the fifties and the sixties, forget yeah. about it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Well, so the last thing um, I wanted to say on Clark, and of course we're we will do uh, Mr. Clark and, and dive or Sir Clark, excuse me. Mm-hmm. Huh? Mm-hmm. Uh, and the uh, dig into that potential, horror story that Brad was just telling us um, on another episode of Art of Darkness at artofdarkpod.com. But here is a letter that he sent to, uh, I've got my notes here. So he shared an agent with another fellow and they made a connection. He got a letter to Clark and Clark wrote back to him in June of 2007. Um, uh Please give my regards and say I have many happy, happy memories of the, of the Hotel Chelsea. It has been involved. Oh, and this, this must have been to the Stanley fellow who, uh, I can't remember the surname off the top of my head, but the, the fellow who was, was still running the hotel. Different Stanley. Can't okay. confuse our Stanley. The Huber? Sir. Huber? Was um, uh, no, let me look it up because I want to hear it right. Stanley Bard. Bard. Oh, Bard. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. So uh, he, he's saying here, please give my regards to uh, Stanley. Um, and say, I have many happy memories of the Hotel Chelsea. It has been involved with many of the most important aspects of American and world literary and artistic history. On no account should the memory of these events be obliterated. Please pass this to Stanley and anyone else who should be interested. All good wishes, Arthur, June 2007. So we share his sentiment. We'll do our little part trying to, you know, uh, (laughs) carry the torch. Yeah. Yeah. So fascinating. Um, how much? Uh, how much of his, his stuff have, have, have either of you read? I mean, I read two thousand and one, and I just I love it as a an example of like you you read it and you pair it with the film. There's no other combination of a book and a film that that do your brain the same way that those two do. It's re- yeah. it's really a unique experience. Yeah, I've read the two thousand one Space Odyssey, and then is there one or two sequels? 2010 is really good. 2010 is good. I do recall 2010 does this thing that a lot of science fiction sort of series do where they kind of, they're sort of in an arms race with themselves. So they have to get like weirder and weirder and weirder. (laughs) And so I remember by the end of 2010, it's like, what is like, is that what we're doing on the show? (laughs) A little bit, probably a little bit. It's okay. Good stuff comes out of it. It's good to notice. Good to notice. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. All right. In any case, so uh, we're in the '60s, and this feels. And Michael, we're gonna. I'm gonna pass it off to you yeah. here uh, shortly. But this feels like really where we're getting into the the image of the Chelsea Hotel that I think most people have. Probably, um, in part because of uh, Andy Warhol and and this art film. Chelsea Girls. Have either of you tried to watch this thing? Uh, it, it, on your recommendation, I <laughs> <laughs> stand clear. <laughs> uh, it's, it is, it's extremely bizarre. Uh, it did inspire Nico's 
1967 debut album, Chelsea Girl, right? Of right. course, we're getting into, you know, all this. Um, it was shot at the Hotel Chelsea and other locations in New York City and follows the lives of several of the young women living there and stars many of Warhol's superstars. The film is presented on a split screen accompanied by alternating soundtracks attached to each scene and an alternation between black and white and color uh, photography. The original cut runs at just over three hours long. Hmm. So you can try to imagine <laughs> this experience and it's, I'm going to guess that drugs were involved probably in the creation of it and in the enjoyment of it by mm-hmm. any number of people. Now my, well, let me read a review uh, from Roger, Roger Ebert uh, in his, his one star review of <laughs> Chelsea girls from June 26, 1967. Oh, and for the record, I'm not a, a Warhol partisan. I'm not trying to you know take him down. Not by any stretch. Um, in fact, uh, this this new Netflix series about Warhol is extremely uh, strong documentary. I, mm. I cannot recommend it enough. It's riveting, riveting because this is this guy who was was on camera a lot and he was yeah. he, he was famous at a very young age. A very interesting guy. Warhol, Catholic from Pittsburgh, makes his way to New York and becomes the the figure that he did. Just incredible. However, mm. Roger Ebert did not see it. Uh, <laughs> Chelsea girls must be believed to be seen like so many other elements of Andy Warhol's world. It has little intrinsic worth. You must have the faith before you go into the theater. You must be as the used car dealers say pre-sold. If you aren't, this film will not win you over on its own terms as a great film can and should. It will simply lie there before you on the theater wall, winking first with one screen, then the other. For what we have here is three and a half hours of split screen improvisation, poorly photo- photographed, hardly edited at all, employing perversion and sensation like chili sauce to disguise the aroma of the meal. Warhol has nothing to say and no technique to say it with. He simply wants to make movies, and he does. Hours and hours of them. <laughs> Chelsea Girls. <laughs> if Chelsea Girls had been the work of Joe Schultz of Chicago, even Warhol might have found it me- merely pathetic. Uh, and it goes on. You can just imagine. I mean, what a, what a biting review because yeah, to think, thing, man. he Jeez. definitely went out of his way to think of the one thing that would potentially hurt Warhol the most, which would be like to compare him to a used car dealer. I mean, Oof. I mean, that is a, a, a stinging indictment. This review is worth, worth um, reading in its entirety just because it's, it's really well written. Um, and it's not entirely off base, but, you know, it, you know art like this at this time was going to be really divisive. I have a, um, something that you're going to want to see uh, in the theater of the mind. I can kind of uh, describe it. It's one of these, one of these, uh, these women. And it's, it's the poster art for the show and she's she's naked and then all of these like hotel rooms are are opening all throughout her body it kind of is reminiscent of maybe dolly with the cabinets you know and you can see her breasts and there's a big door down you know between her legs and everything it's super evocative super provocative um and i'm going to read something about it from the uh the tate modern here which is one of my favorite places i need to go back to london um Throughout his career, Warhol made numerous films, many of which were experimental and pushed the boundaries of what was considered acceptable in cinema. Chelsea Girls, however, was the art house film which stepped into the mainstream with incredible success. It consists of 12 reels of unedited conversations and monologues with Warhol's superstars, captured for the most part at New York's famous Chelsea Hotel. The film was then projected two reels at a time, combining separate, often contrasting stories. With its creativity and eroticism, this poster captures the essence of the film. It was designed for the release of the movie in London by the graphic artist Alan Aldridge. Warhol was extremely happy with the design and commented that he wished the movie was as good as the poster. Mm. (laughs) So Andy might have had a little bit of a sense of uh, what it was. But um, (laughs) the one possible insight I had into this is, you know, I kind of find it unwatchable. I think partly because like well it's not meant to be screened uh you know in a, in a house in, in minnesota it, yeah. it's meant to be uh midnight 
maybe you and your friends have, uh, you know, you're, you're, you've, been, you've been to the White, the White Horse Tavern, yeah. right? <laughs> and it's, it's time to take a walk down to the one theater in the world that's showing this movie. Right. And it's, it's meant to be an experience. But I, it also dawned on me that, you know, what do we think about when we think about Warhol? We think about the, the famous uh, saying, everyone, you know, in the future, everybody, everyone will have their 15 minutes of fame, whatever. Mm-hmm. Right. And he was right. He did predict the age that we're in now. And this movie is kind of an example of like quasi reality TV. Like it's not that far from from Chelsea girls to the Kardashians. Right. On that, yeah. You said it's unedited conversations. Right. So it's just he's just capturing the, the, the vibe of what was going on at that time. Yeah. 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 I could and I could see part of I could see even that being an event to go see at that time. Andy Warhol is this known quantity. There's interesting people are going to be going to see it. They're going to, you know, you'll be talking to them in line and talking to them after. And it was probably a whole kind of event that the uh, is floating around the film. And so whether well, and or not that, the film stands on its own is kind of, yeah. Well, that's it. I mean, and that's the next thing that uh, Roger Ebert went on to say. He said, the key to understanding Chelsea Girls and so many other products of the New York underground is to realize that it depends upon a cult for its initial acceptance mm-hmm. and upon a great many provincial cult aspirers for its commercial appeal. Be- mm-hmm. Provincial so- cult aspirers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> okay, I mean, yeah. Yeah, Where's right? the lie? Yeah, so, yeah, because then you know. some, you're out in Minnesota and it's playing and you can be like in the, you know, the years after it came out, you could be the hip guy who knows about Chelsea girls. Yeah. Have you seen this movie, man? Yeah. 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 All right. Well, so that, that was our, that's going to be our little interlude or, you know, for, for Warhol, we could, we, you know, this could just go on forever. Uh, but it, it's 66. Okay. So we're kind of hanging out in the late sixties with Andy Warhol and all his Chelsea girls and all the rest. And uh, who should show up, but, Leonard Cohen. And I know, Michael, you have some, some things you want to say about this. Yeah. So, I mean, there's like a direct connection there in that uh, one of the first people, here's the difference with Leonard Cohen and, and, and later I'm going to be doing Patti Smith and, and Robert Maplethorpe. They very much overlap. And these are artists that hadn't found any success yet. In fact, some of them didn't even know what they wanted to do really what they would end up becoming famous for, but they were drawn to the Chelsea Hotel specifically because of what it was. Um, so Leonard Cohen has returned from living on Hydra. Uh, I mean, he, he's not returning. He comes to New York from Hydra, uh, where he uh, had been living with a, a woman, her son. Hydra? Where is yeah, Hydra? I, sorry, that's an island in uh, the Aegean Sea uh, that was kind of an artist's huh. mecca. Okay. Uh, in the in the mid '60s, and uh, he comes to New York and stays at the Chelsea Hotel. And who should he run into but Nico, who uh. he he uh, ends up in her room and they're kind of getting slightly intimate. And she socks him and says, "I don't want to fall in love with you." <laughs> <laughs> um, Go write a song, yeah. right? But he wasn't much of a song. I mean, he'd written he he said that he had learned uh, guitar from this. Spanish guy that he'd run into in Montreal when he was like a teenager and he'd always kind of traveled around with a guitar and he'd he'd written a few songs at that point but he'd never uh, put anything on on tape he never you know he wasn't he he'd barely played live he'd played for friends or he'd played in you know cafes and 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 coffee shops and he is befriended by Judy Collins uh, who was kind of big in the folk movement then if you don't know her she's got, got the super long brown hair and beautiful blue eyes. Judy Blue Eyes was written by, you know, hmm. sung by uh, Crosby, Stills, and Nash about her. And she introduces him, she starts covering some of the songs he's, he's written. And she introduces him to John Hammond, who, if you don't know who he is, he was the legendary A&R man who he did like Count Basie. He did Bob Dylan. He did uh, Billie Holiday, I believe. Like he just like, he new talent and this had spanned decades and he was like i think he went to judy collins uh, apartment recorded in her bathroom <laughs> a couple of <laughs> demos and based on that hammond was like i'm going to come to your room in the ho- in the chelsea hotel and just like listen to you play i want to hear you play he was 32 years old at the time which at that point like 
most record labels were looking for 17 year olds playing rock and roll. And here was like a 32 year old Canadian Jewish poet. <laughs> and he signed him on the spot. He was like, I'm bringing this in. And his record label was like, you're crazy, but you're John Hammond. Uh -huh. <laughs> and the rest is, so he, is history. He had a great instinct. And yeah. this is the, this is the, is the, uh, the period to me where the hotel starts to feel like it's luring them in now this is yeah it had a culture it had a community um you were mentioning uh, this guy uh harry smith um he was a, a folklorist uh he had, he had collected a um maybe you can read the blurb on that but he had he had won a grammy yeah, with uh, a, he, so he, his period was from the late 60s into the late 70s harry everett smith and he's described as a beat generation filmmaker artist collector and Chelsea eccentric. So if you're yeah. if you're the eccentric at the Chelsea yeah, Hotel, right. <laughs> yeah, he was a uh, an OTO mainstay. So now we're getting into Mr. Crowley <laughs> and the, the, the neo gnostic uh -huh. bishop. You know, ah, yeah, right. so that that that, that episode is going to be great. Oh, by the way, Brad, I think I know who we're going to do that one with. We'll we'll sidebar on that. Oh, okay, but okay. He won a Grammy for anthology of American folk music. Yeah, it was hugely and influential for you know. People in the six, you know, the mid to late hmm. '60s. So listen to that music. Well, um, and here's another fun fact: he survived for years on raw eggs, vodka, and, and amphetamine. <laughs> right. <Yes. laughs> he smoked a lot of weed too, yeah, from what I uh, read yeah. in the I other bet. memoir. If you I go bet. so far as to join the Crowley organization, mm -hmm. <laughs> you're, yeah, you're the eccentric guy at the uh, hotel. That, but that also reminds me of that anecdote uh, about Bowie, who, of course, we're going to do surviving for years off of milk and peppers and cocaine, and I believe. And cocaine yeah, and yeah, wow. yeah. So we've got a kindred yeah. spirit here. Maybe there's something <laughs> in the Crowley book I'm not getting. Um, uh, Brad, you were yeah, going to say. Yeah, I don't remember that part of the, uh, part of the Crowley lore, but um, they, uh, the, the Harry Everett Smith, there's, oh, I wish I could remember the name of the film now. There's a great film you can watch on YouTube that it's an animated film that he made. Oh shoot. It's, it has like four different names. Um, but if you type in Harry, Harry Everett Smith animation to YouTube, it'll come up and it's a weird little collage. I kind of watched a few minutes of it and found myself sucked in. It's a weird little collage sci-fi little stoner. It's not even really a movie cause there's not really quite a story to it exactly. But, um, it seems like it's ahead of its time in a lot of ways. It's very strange, but very clearly very deliberate. Is it deliberate. called Early Abstractions? Is that what it is? No, it's no. something about the... Oh, I wish I had it at my at my fingertips. It's like the Hour of Magic or something Heaven like that. Heaven and Earth Magic. Heaven and Earth Magic. That's that's the one. It's about an hour long. Uh, it's hmm. a trip. All right. Hmm. Cool. So, yeah, we're definitely getting into a, a different period of time. And so... Hmm. And Cohen gravitated uh, he, to the to the hotel, and that and that got him his deal, right? So mm -hmm. yeah, so I, I have a qu couple of quotes for you here. Um, at the time, it was in journalist Thelma Blitz's estimation a big boho fraternity house. Um, so he <laughs> said, <laughs> Leonard Cohen said in Song Talk in 1993, I came to New York. And I was living at other hotels and I'd heard about the Chelsea Hotel as being a place where I might meet people of my own kind. And I did. It was a grand, mad place. I love hotels to which at 4 a.m. you can bring along a midget, a bear, and four ladies, take them to your room, and no one cares about it at all. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Fun. And of course, he, he betted uh, Janis Joplin rather famously, or she betted him <laughs> and, right. and wrote, so, a, wrote a song about it. So I'm, what I'm pulling from here is a Rolling Stone article that was um, published after, just after he died. Um, I also read, let's go through the biographies here. I'm your man, the life of Leonard Cohen. And there's oh, about four okay. or five references to Chelsea Hotel in there because he kept going back. Um, he had different residencies there. Um, but uh, so he was, he gets the record contract. He's having trouble recording the album. Um, it's being reworked. It, you know, he was a singer songwriter. So figuring out how to produce that package it, who is it going to be recorded on top of it? How are they going to overdub it? How are they going to sell this thing? Mm -hmm. um, it was kind of, it hadn't been released. Nothing was much was going on with him. Um, 
and he runs into literally, well, he, he's a famous kind of depressive. So he says, it was a dismal evening in New York City. Uh, this was, he said this in a concert. He decided to go out middle of the night, I think it was about two in the morning, and he goes out to a greasy spoon called the Bronco Burger. I had a cheeseburger. It didn't help at all. Yuck. <laughs> then he went to the White Horse Tavern looking for Dylan Thomas, but Dylan Thomas was dead. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so oh, no. he, he turns around and he comes back. Pardon me, there's a motorcycles in the background. That's all right. He comes back. You're you're the one that's in the city. You're the one in the city. This is atmosphere, actually. This is good. You don't apologize for that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, he comes back and uh, he takes the elevator, which if you haven't commented on the elevator yet, I mean, this is kind of like the Overlook Hotel. It is, it's, it's, it's just a weird elevator system and it's super slow. Like I've had it take 10 minutes for me to get to the 10th floor there. I timed it. I got a haircut on Tuesday, and it, it only took a minute. But that was okay. a minute to go 10 floors, which also, is kind of a lot for... Yeah. If we gave you a minute of dead air on this episode... It, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've had it take even longer than that. In, in yeah. any event, he gets on, and he sees this interesting young woman on there that I think he knew was uh, Janis Joplin based on the fact that, you know, she, she had one album out and she was recording her second album coincidentally in the same studio that he'd been toiling at. Mm. They hadn't met before. And he says, she wasn't looking for me. She was looking for Chris Christopherson, <laughs> who she was, he was actually teaching her at the time that I learned from the uh, Patty Smith book. He was teaching her me and Bobby McGee. He'd written it not for her, but literally was Whoa. teaching her that song at the time. And uh, Cohen says, I wasn't looking for her. I was looking for Bridget Bardot. <laughs> yeah. <well. laughs> sure. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> but we fell into each other's arms through some process of elimination. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's swell. <laughs> um, anyway, he, he ended up eventually, you know, he, he writes this song about her, which you already quoted in the, in the beginning. And, uh, it comes out of the fact that she died a, a little while later. I think it was a year or two later. Um, and he mm. was really devastated by it. And he wrote a version of the, of the song called uh, Chelsea Hotel. Eventually that was Chelsea Hotel number one. That's never, there's not really a recorded, like a studio recorded version of it. And then uh, I think he performed it a few times when he, eventually his career was taking off. And he rewrites it. Interestingly enough, in Ethiopia, and uh, writes the, the version that we know there, mm. um, which is, you know, full of kind of sweetness, but it's also a disconnect. And I, I don't know, that song makes me cry. If you want to, if you needed to have me cry on camera, like I'd be like, <laughs> can you give me like two and a half, three minutes so I can listen to this song? Because oh. it just, it, it kills me. I'm not familiar with it, to be honest. Oh, I wasn't either yeah. until this episode. Yeah. Oh, oh, Brad, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read you the lyrics right now. Okay. I'm read them okay. again. I remember you well in the Chelsea Hotel. You were talking so brave and so sweet, giving me head on the unmade bed while the limousines wait in the street. Those were the reasons, and that was New York. We were running for the money and the flesh. And that was called love for the workers in song, probably still is for those of them left. Hmm. Yeah, I got a little because mm. I'm having a little bit of this is personal, but I'm having a little bit of New York nostalgia, right? I hear things are starting mm. to open up. We left mm. a couple of years ago. The world has been a has been a shambles, and uh, artists gravitate to that town. I gravitated to that town, uh, and I I'm gonna have to visit. I'm gonna have to come back. I, I, there's a chance I'll live there once again. And that yeah. that song did kind of hook into my got my mm. got my heartstring a little bit because. Mm -hmm. You move to that town for certain reasons, man. Everybody has their own reason, and yet they're all kind of the same. Yeah. No. But he, re he, he mentioned it, I think, in concerts that it was her. And then mm -hmm. years later, he came to really regret that because he, he felt that he was kind of a gentleman. Uh, and, uh, I kissed yeah. him. Yeah. Why'd I do that? Yeah, that yeah, is, that is kind of the ultimate case of kissing and telling. Yeah. So yeah. he kind of... That was like a, a regret that he talked Ooh. about for decades afterwards that he really regretted um, oh, that he I'm had so, said I'm sorry that. Sorry, we're amplifying that, but man, there it is. This is the dark well, no, side it's out there, it. and you know, he did his penance for it, I suppose. But but he had tremendous respect for, it, and he kind of you know 
it, it wasn't that he had an affair. He just had a night with her, mm-hmm. but uh, he he respected her. He loved her. That is such in a that odd moment, combination you know? of two people I have because both of those two are kind of ciphers to me. Like mm. Leonard Cohen, I've never understood. I hope to one day. I just never, never got into him. Joplin, I might have like one record. Mm-hmm. But thinking about the two of them together, the the girl from Texas who had gone out to California, I think, and then but now she's in New York yeah. recording. This guy, I guess, spent time in Ethiopia, and he was in the Aegean. And what were these? <laughs> the Kenyans, the French. Well, Canadian, he was he was only in Ethiopia once. He was a singer, and somehow he no, must have sure, booked a date sure. there. But, yeah, I mean, but, you know, but he still, was a French Canadian. He'd been living in yeah. Greece, and they're very mm-hmm. different. You know, uh, yeah. It, 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 She's it from Port Arthur, me. Louisiana, I think. Yeah. Oh, was she? A, she, she went spent- to University of Texas, though, for briefly. That makes sense. Yeah, she go. actually lived um, at a place that is continuously running. I think it's the Bluebird Motel. Something like that. That was right around the corner from where I lived in Austin, probably oh, wow. a quarter mile away. And it's one of these sort of like, you know, it's a motel, but people live there for extended periods of time. And even if you go by now, it looks like Janis Joplin could live there. <laughs> you know what I mean? It looks yeah. like it's a lot. They're like, oh, those people are hanging out their laundry on a on a clothesline from the door of the hotel to their van. It's that kind of like very bohemian, very, uh, you know different set of rules apply there it's pretty cool yeah well, yeah so i mean that was kind of you know those were his digs and that was where he felt inspired to write he, he you know he moved around quite a bit in his life but but that period he kept going he kept going back there um whenever he needed to be in new york and and wrote quite a few songs while he was there i mean you know you could pick up janice joplin in the elevator i mean bring it on <laughs> i keep coming back but oh, he actually man. in the person i'm going to profile Later, uh, Patty Smith and, and Robert Mablethorpe, he met them at the time yeah. that he was living let's, there. Let's get into it. That's the next thing that's up on the, on the dock here. So, yeah, let's talk about it. I just watched an, uh, an interview with Patty Smith, uh, Smith at, I think it was like the Louisiana Book Festival or something. Mm-hmm. And she was talking about uh, meeting Robert Mablethorpe because she has that famous uh, biography. Uh, just kids or something yeah and yeah that's um, what i've been rereading this week it's oh. just it was great the first time i read it and then rereading it for this it's she's such a good writer i well, mean when she talks she's yeah and she's so eloquent uh speaking as well and um she said the thing that you said earlier that none of these people were famous then yeah. they didn't know they were all going to be legends she talked about the cult of personality had not taken off warhol saw it coming because he helped invent it but that was an unstoppable train, you know. It's yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. not one that she necessarily was on board with, but uh, Maplethorpe was more. I mean, Maplethorpe saw that and wanted to gravitate towards where there was cultural power. Yeah, um, I'll read you a quote from. Uh, this is uh, one of Leonard Cohen's friends that had run into her. Leonard had met Patti Smith the year before and taken her to dinner with Irving and Aviva Layton. She was just a young kid then, said Aviva, a skinny little waif, no breasts, and wearing rags, not feathers. I think she may have been living on the street. I don't think it's true, having read her memoir. Uh, but she was living in a kind of a, a rundown apartment building in, in Brooklyn. And Leonard told us, She's a genius. Absolutely brilliant. She's going to be a real force. Hmm. And this is what I get. You know, lots of people just kind of responded to her. Mm -hmm. Like she didn't put herself out. She was shy, but she runs into everyone. She does. (laughs) And the biggest of the biggest people just like kind of like see her as a kindred spirit. Mm -hmm. Um, She'd been from um, Jersey, kind of South Jersey I don't know if it's quite Pine Barrens area, but uh, I think it's called like North Dar or Upper Darby is where she's from. And she comes to New York and she falls in love with Robert Maplethorpe. And it's, it's that they're, they're just kids. Um, and they were living out in Brooklyn trying to make their way as artists, but they don't even know what kind of artists they're going to be. They're just finding, literally finding stuff in, you know, garbage piles, finding stuff in like Woolworths, putting together pastiches and murals and, you know, just, creating art as they can. And she went back, I think she traveled with her sister to Paris, again, living just like in a tenement in Paris with her sister on a shoestring budget. They never had any money for years and years and years. And she comes back and Robert was not doing well. 
he had gotten uh i think he had gonorrhea he had like trench mouth i don't even know what that is oh my gosh he had lice he couldn't you know he had lost unbelievable amounts of Opening weight he was living in this <laughs> yeah he was living in this horrible horrible um building that was f like full of uh drug addicts that were kind of like it, it was basically almost like a, a home where you get you where 20 year old 20 something year olds go to die yeah and uh she nursed him back to health they got their portfolios together and they walked into the chelsea hotel met stanley bard and said will you take us here's oh, wow. our art portfolios and oh. he did he gave them a little room on the 10th floor which is the same floor that my friend Gerald lives on yeah. a tiny, tiny little place with a one black and white television that they never plugged in. Huh. <laughs> and they lived their life there. Um, Robert could never hold down like a regular job, but mm. he took to hustling and temp work, <laughs> but mm. literally hustling like in yeah. Times Square. Oh my uh, God. And she got a job at Scribner's, which was like a, a bookstore. Mm. So she was able to kind of hold down a regular job and she kept trying to do the visual art and he kept making this this visual art and she kept saying to him um what he would do is he would go to 42nd street like essentially like porn shops and buy what was called at the time men's magazines because he wanted to cut out and make collages out of them mm -hmm. but it was expensive these magazines were expensive and uh it became a problem she was like robert you just got to start making your own pictures like you, you need to become a photographer and out of that kind of necessity is how he ended up becoming this amazing photographer eventually. Huh. And for her, she was realizing that visual art maybe wasn't her thing. I've seen this so many times with so many musicians, like David Bowie's a great example. Um, uh, David Byrne is another example. Mm -hmm. I even think like Mick Jagger, Charlie Watts, like all these people essentially at some point were visual artists. Many mm -hmm. of them went to art school and then they find themselves in the sixties late sixties, um, getting into music and, and she started to develop her, her poetry hmm. into, uh, lyrics and then, and then eventually became a, a singer. Hmm. Yeah, but this is cool. all at the Chelsea hotel. So uh, of oh, anyone yeah. that we've talked about so far, like that was her That's home. Right. Yeah. And I love this idea. I love this image of them bringing sort of kind of run out of places to go and bringing their bringing their portfolio yeah. so you're like applying for a art fellowship or something right yeah and, and like, it's literally <laughs> just a place to live that's at the heart of the the world and yeah. and people you know if you you're not a new yorker you've never lived in new york look there's there is an attitude that um, among certain people who end up there that it's like they would not ever think about ever even possibly remotely living anywhere else. Um, <laughs> and it's true. And maybe they're right. Maybe they're wrong. I mean, I meet people who go, I could never, I, I can't, I can't last a weekend in New York city. Then there are other types that it's just, that's where it's at. And it just sounds like that was where it was at for them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. A certain breed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I mean, the people that she ran into, I mean, she has, uh, she ran into, she had it like a stuffed, I mean, she, she was always collecting weird things. She had a stuffed crow and she was walking through the lobby with this stuffed crow <laughs> and who should she run into, but a bewildered, uh, shy, uh, skittish looking Salvador Dali. <laughs> <laughs> who of course immediately is taken by her. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I like to imagine them too. Hello, the strange lady. Back. I'm sure that conversation is great, but I, also, I, I kind of like to imagine them just sort of walking by each other and sort of just kind of giving each other a nod. You know, they both continue on with their lives. Yeah. Wow. What a, what a, she went to the, a, mm. yeah, she went to the automat down the street, which if people don't know what automats are, but back in the day, it was a place where you could like, there was a kitchen in the back and there were like little, little windows that you could open up and just buy the food there. So it was super cheap and there was like no frills mm -hmm. and she couldn't get it open. And some guy comes up and like, it's like, Oh, let me help you. And puts a dime in and gets it out and starts chatting her up. And he seems really interested in her. And then she realizes it's Allen Ginsberg. Huh. And then he says, Oh, are you a boy? <laughs> <laughs> wow. she says no he goes oh i'm so sorry i took you for a very attractive young boy 
<laughs> oh my god! Oh no! <laughs> as soon as she said no, Alan Ginsberg god, is like, "Well, uh, why is it the out. Nambla alarm has have to go off for this episode? Yeah. Not once, yeah. but twice." Yeah. Oh, right. Um, but they would they would uh, you know cross paths quite a bit later. Um, mm. You know, because she she ended up getting um, inspired to become a performing artist mm-hmm. um, after all of this. And she would become uh, fairly close to William S. Burroughs. Yeah, a little a little later. I don't know if this is probably later than than this time frame when she was moving into the Chelsea. But was her Burroughs a resident here? At he was point? not. I don't think a resident, but he was. A, he frequented it. Um, he I think was he in and out. A, yeah, I think he spent a fair amount of time at El Quixote. Yeah, El Quixote. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So well, let me Michael's, just, if you don't mind, yeah. let me just read from this. Just yeah, kids. Not at all. Yes. Not at all. So this is this is Patty Smith's voice. Um, I'm in Mike Hammer mode, puffing on cools, reading cheap detective novels, sitting in the lobby waiting for William Burroughs. He comes in, dressed to the nines in a dark gabardine overcoat, gray suit and tie. I sit for a few hours at my post scribbling poems. He comes stumbling out of the El Quixote, a bit drunk and disheveled. I straighten his tie and hail him a cab. It's our unspoken routine. So, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> that's pretty cool <laughs> nice that's pretty cool hmm. the yeah. other thing that i have to this is just I, I had forgotten this how they how they met but she goes and sees a band it's called the holy modal rollers the holy modal Ro- rollers yeah i've heard of this they had had um a song they, that was on the soundtrack of easy rider she sees them and she's oh, like yeah. oh this this band's pretty cool but i really like the drummer so she meets him afterwards and they talk a little bit and the guy introduces himself as Slim Shadow. She's like, oh, Slim, cool. Well, I live at the Chelsea Hotel. You should come visit me sometime. And he starts kind of courting her and, and visiting her and they're hanging out a bit. She doesn't go into the details, um, but she gets diagnosed as uh, anemic. So she doesn't have any money and she steals a couple of steaks from a local grocery store called Gristiti's and puts them in her coat pocket and runs into this guy, Slim Shadow, on the street. And uh, <laughs> she has to sort of confess to him. She's like, sorry, man, I, I got to get back to the hotel because I've got, I've got steak in my pocket. <laughs> and he's like, what? <laughs> so she, he, she shows him the steak. They go back. She cooks him the meal. And he says, you know, maybe you need to have a real meal. How much are you eating? Yeah. And uh, he takes her to this place, Max's Kansas City, which was the, the hangout for Warhol and says i'm gonna buy you like the biggest lobster they have there she's like why is this drummer such such a like you know high roller well some one of warhol's crew is there and kind of like comes up to her and is like what are you doing on a date with sam shepherd uh, <laughs> <that's> <laughs> like, what are you talking about the, uh, sam this guy's shepherd, name yeah, is slim what are you talking yeah, about yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. he had just kept up this whole charade for a while I think just for the fun of it. I mean, she, but she saw him as a kindred spirit. Like he was mm. a storyteller. He was, uh, you know, he was assuming this identity as Slim Shadow, this Shadow. guy who, from the desert who'd grown up in a trailer. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to be another great episode. I can't wait to do that. Uh, yeah. I go out to Stillwater here sometimes and you can still find bartenders. Oh, wow. who go, oh I remember, I remember when, when Sam would come in and I love Stillwater. In Minnesota, out here uh, in Minnesota, he could, he could go to the bar in downtown Stillwater. Everybody would leave him alone. Half the ninety percent of the people probably didn't even know who he was, and the ones they that did were too polite to to make make problems. You know, so yeah, he's one of my personal heroes for sure. That's going to be a fun episode. Yeah, yeah, cool. So I mean, I, mean, I could go can. on and on. I just I highly recommend reading this book. It is mm. she is such a fantastic writer, and she really captures it. I I, I thought I would like have a few references to talk about, but her, her section on the, on the Chelsea hotel entitled Chelsea hotel runs to about a hundred pages. So there's <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> immense, but yeah. so now, and we're going to come back to this Stanley Bard fellow and give him his due at the end, because now right. we're definitely well into the period where he's taken over and he's cultivating this. Now it isn't, Oh, we're accidentally the place where the, where the artists are, or, Oh, we have a little bit of history with this. Now it's, it's on full blown. I'll work with you. If you want to trade paintings for, for a room, you know, if, if I think you have talent, if blah, 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 we'll kind of let you come in and, and make a life here. Um, that's something pretty spectacular. 
and unique. And you think about to like New York and just how crowded everything is, how New York is a war constantly for space and for protein. I mean, so <laughs> Patty Smith coming back to her tiny room with steaks in her pocket. That's yeah. a very, that's a so very go. New York story. Um, well, cool. So I want to, do you, do you have anything else? Uh, on, on the well, I Smith, just, uh, I mentioned yeah. that she ran into so many different people there, but I mean, I, I couldn't let it go without also saying that she had really intense, um, uh, interactions with Janis Joplin and also with Jimi Hendrix. Um, mm. Just in that they got each other, you know, and uh, she spent time with him and talked to him and, and saw him as a, sh a shy, sweet guy. Um, not this kind of like, you know, blowing the world up with his guitar kind of thing. Um, and then, uh, you know, everybody was shaken when both Janis and he died and she spent time the night that uh, I guess, I guess it was the night that, that Janice died uh, with Johnny Winters, who was the same age. He was 27. I don't know if you know Johnny Winters. This is that amazing guitarist with the yeah. white hair. Yeah. And he was completely freaked out. So, Brad, you'll like this. Because he was like, oh, my God, like all these people are dying. Jim Morrison uh, and Janice and, and Jimi Hendrix, they're all named Jay. They're all my age. <laughs> so she did his tarot. Oh, boy. Yeah. And did she pull out some death cards? She didn't. She said, you know, <laughs> he was going to be fine. And she, her comment was that he was so worked up that, like, death wouldn't be able to find him. Like, ah, okay. He's moved, he moved so quickly, there was no way he was going to get tracked down. <laughs> we're, uh, we're kind of coming into the third act of the story here. There are a couple of things that I want to cover. Um, Arthur Miller spent some time at uh, the Chelsea Hotel, and I think – I think even wrote a, wrote a short play about it. Um, when asked if the Chelsea was a good place to stay in New York, Arthur Miller uh, warned a foreign friend that it was less a European grand hotel and more a sort of Guatemala or outer Queens. And perhaps it was. <laughs> That's from this uh, uh, book review of uh, Inside the, the Dream Palace in the Sydney Morning Herald, which... Um, has a has a good summer, summary of it. Um, and I, I want to read a couple of paragraphs from this. So this review uh, is by Adrian McKinty about the, the book that uh, I've been reading. Um, in the early 90s, I spent a night in New York's famous Chelsea Hotel, just so that I could say I spent a night in the Chelsea Hotel. It was not a pleasant experience. <laughs> The ancient springless bed was infested with bugs. Armies of cockroaches marched across the floor. The heating pipes clanged, and at two in the morning, the man in the room above began alter alternately screaming and sobbing. And then beneath, there's a picture of a couple of burly men dragging out a body bag, which is Nancy Spungen's body uh, taken from the hotel after her likely murder by Sid Vicious, which would have happened, oh, what year did that happen in? 1978. So I'm, I'm leading us toward a, a kind of, a, you know, the, the bohemian dream is to, has gotten dark from mm -hmm. the 70s into the 80s. Uh, you have this horrific murder in October of 78. Uh, Spungen was found dead in the bathroom of the couple's room with a single stab wound to the abdomen. Uh, Sid Vicious was charged with murder, but died of a heroin overdose well, well on bail in February mm. of 79 before it went to trial. Some people speculate he didn't kill her, but that it was a drug dealer who, you know, visited the room to give them drugs, uh, mm. who, who potentially did it. Um, mm. So I don't, I don't want to dwell on the murder too much, uh, but needless to say, this, hmm, I think we just need to start to see this as a place that has given over somewhat to, to squalor. Um, and, and this author in the Sydney, the Sydney Morning Herald goes on, but I got out al uh, alive more than can, than can be said for Sid Vicious's girlfriend, Nancy Spungen, whom he stabbed to death in room 100 uh, other, under the influence of heroin. Dylan Thomas too didn't survive his stay at the Chelsea. His reputed last words, I've just had 18 whiskeys. I think that's the record we're uttered in room 205. So, you know, I think, I think you could dwell on this stuff. Like if you go online and you end up on, on YouTube, there, there are a couple of like kind of corny, oh, the ghosts of the Chelsea Hotel and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, it's, it's a pretty big place. It's 12 stories. 
It's got hundreds of rooms that have been split apart from the original 80. Mm. Uh, any place like that is going to pick up residue of these memories and it's going to have some bad stuff happen at some point. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah. Well, so we're moving, we're moving more into our own kind of contemporary time. Um, I do want to hint again at our After Dark story, which we're going to do Ooh. about this fellow, Elpheus Philemon Cole, who lived to be 112 years old uh, inside the hotel. Uh, so if you want to hear that, subscribe to the, the, to the Patreon. Yeah, 112 years and 136 days. He was the world's oldest verified living man, and he, he lived in this hotel. So that will be at uh, patreon.com slash artofdarkpod. We'll probably also try to eke out a few more uh, you know, personal stories from, from Michael. I think we'll talk about this uh, darkroom guest we're going to have on, the, the, the stylist or the, well, whatever, whatever the term is, Michael. Um, and uh, we're just going to continue to talk about the Chelsea Hotel. Uh, moving into the, the, I guess, the sort of modern era here, Brad, do you have any insights into, like, what is this place? And it does, it's like a capturing, <laughs> it, it captures, it started as this calm communal mm-hmm. ideal, but then by the 60s, you've got Patty Smith with a, a stuffed crow meeting, right. <laughs> meeting Salvador, Salvador Dali, Dali in the lobby. Yeah. So it's, it, yeah. to me, it feels like a place that became the place that it, it needed to be for a period of time. Mm-hmm. Is that mm-hmm. fair to say? That sounds, that sounds right. But, it, but, you know, I think you don't have to dig too far to make it into a some kind, you know, it's almost feels cheesy, but it's right there. Some kind of like metaphor for America, right? It, yeah. You know, it starts, it starts as this, uh, um, you know, be as dismissive of communes as you want. It does. That is an idealistic dream, right? That you're going to make this place, and the the people who built it are going to be shoulder to shoulder with with artists, and and we're going to have this sort of beautiful environment where we all, you know, try to live out some kind of dream. It goes bankrupt immediately, right? Because because <laughs> because America ain't got no time for that unless it can turn a buck, and. Yeah. And, and, and then and then it kind of it feels like it's morphing with the times. It's wild when America is wild, um, and and in you know in the sixties and the seventies, or at least that's how we feel like America was. Kind of looking back, maybe that's a History Channel perspective. Um, and then now we're in this. Um, now we're in this strange phase where it, it, even the fact that it's under constant reconstruction feels appropriate somehow. Like it's still mm. trying to hang on to what it was at one point, but it can't quite maybe, you know, somebody has bought it to, to try and try and make, uh, try and turn a real profit on it. But, but what made it amazing was the fact that somebody was willing to not make a profit on it, if that makes sense. And, and yeah. you know, now you got some yeah. kind of kind of cash in on that and a little bit well, cruder and, and of, we a, have of a way. Such an uneasy relationship with history and with mm-hmm. celebrity. Uh, yeah. yeah. So that seems to come out. Right, right. And so now, you know, it does make you wonder what is ultimately the fate of it. I mean, it's not going to stand there forever, right? Um, well, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the state of it now. Okay. Uh, yeah. But I wanted to ask, uh, Michael, what, did, what is your, your impression? And you've been there, you spend time there. Does it, what does it strike you as? Is it like the, the Hotel in the Shining or is it the Overlook or is it more, is it like the Overlook meets some sort of hippie compound in, in upstate? Well, it's, it's changed or? so much. So when I first probably wandered into the lobby, I, you know, it, it was, I kind of had like a hushed reverence for it. I was like, do I belong in here? I think, you know, are they going to kick me out? And, you know, there was just kind of crazy art all over the place. It felt really funky and bohemian, um, like I expected. And then sometime over the last 10 years, it just, they just stripped all of the character away. Uh, uh, now, now art is back, but it, it, I don't know where it's come from. It doesn't have that feeling of like, these are like 50, 60 different artists, you know, ways that they pay their rent over 40 Messy. years. Instead, yeah. it's like mm-hmm. they've, they've bought it at, at, uh, you know, from galleries or something, you know, they've, they've, they've made it tasteful. Um, yeah. That being said, the fact that the, the process was so slow of renovating that it's still going on kind of, 
speaks to how weird that place is. I don't know why it would take 11 years <laughs> to, <laughs> to do the work that they've done. Mm-hmm. So it, it kind of has that Brazil, Terry Gilliam feel of like, why is there plastic wrap here? At one point, I, the last time I got my hair cut there before this, there were workers on about six or seven different floors and they kept pushing all the buttons of the elevator. So you would just stop at every floor and then people would get on and get off and they, you know, it, it was a mess. <laughs> so that actually feels in keeping with like the, it's almost like the hotel is fighting against the forces of gentrification. <laughs> when I think the residents have had a very protracted battle, we'll talk a little bit about it here, but I want to give um, the man Stanley Bard his due, the fellow who kind of made all this possible. And this is from his obit in the, um, the New York Times. When his father died in 1964, Mr. Bard took over as manager and began running the hotel with a studied obliviousness until he was forced out of power, out in a power struggle in 2007. I like that studied obliviousness. Quoting, the most beloved and enigmatic character ever to grace the halls of the Chelsea is, of course, our illustrious proprietor, Stanley Bard. Ed Hamilton, a tenant, wrote in Legends of the Chelsea Hotel, living with artists and outlaws in New York's rebel mecca. 2007. Among his many endearing qualities, Stanley possesses a congenital uh, congenital inability to admit that anything bad has ever taken place in the hotel. His positivism bordered on the pathological. Earlier in the book, Jeff Giles wrote of legends in the Chelsea Hotel in the New York Times Book Review. Hamilton passes along a former tenant's uh, story of seeing a swarm of policemen on the ninth floor and assuming that Joe the junkie had finally OD'd. Bard corrected him. The police officers were in fact guests at the hotel and the junkie was vacationing abroad. The tenant, it seemed, had been misled by the stretcher, the corpse, and the body bag. (laughs) Uh, So this is so funny. The filmmaker Milo Schwarman uh, appearing in Abel Ferreira's 2008 documentary Chelsea on the Rocks teasingly asked Mr. Bard on camera whether any guest had ever died at his hotel. Mr. Bar- uh, Bard cited just one in 1988, the, the portrait painter, Elpheus Cole, who lived to be 112, uh, who we're going to talk about on the After Dark. I also have something Didn't else. Didn't even acknowledge Nancy Spungen, huh? Didn't even acknowledge Nancy Spungen. Wow. Too dark, too. Yeah. He was just, he would be the worst guest for our, for our podcast. He wouldn't <laughs> want to talk about any no. of it. Um, which is, uh, you know, uh, maybe, a, maybe a, a character flaw, but it might also be a way to sort of survive this. Yeah. Um, I have a, just a, something from the This Ain't No Holiday Inn book. Uh, in the Chelsea's many floored economic ecosystem, the alpha male was Stanley Bard, its manager and one third owner for over 50 years. It was Stanley Bard who transformed an old hotel into one of the world's most productive and eccentric artist qualities. Stanley's father, the Hungarian immigrant David Bard, had always been in the hotel business when, in 1939, he bought the Hotel Chelsea. Soon after, some long-time Hungarian friends of the Bards, Joseph Gross and Julian Krauss, joined Bard as co-workers. Uh, and then it goes on to talk about them. And, uh, you know, so here we go. Just a little bit about how the hotel became what it is. As naturally as water flows downhill, the Chelsea became an an artist-friendly hotel. The first reason was architecture. Two factors make a good artist's studio, space and light. Searching for the perfect studios, painters might rent lofts in old factories, but these drafty, cavernous spaces, usually lacking kitchens or bathrooms, weren't ideal for making a home. And the average New York hotels, which catered mainly to tourists or business travelers, had only small, poorly lit rooms that were decidedly not artist-friendly. The Chelsea was different. Originally built as a luxury co-op, you could think of that as like upscale condominiums today. It featured spacious rooms with high ceilings and big windows, perfect for painters. It also had kitchens and bathrooms. Uh, David Bard's personal touch, so this is his father, and special interest in the arts also attracted to artists, uh, uh, attracted artists to the Chelsea. This is Stanley talking about his father. He loved the artists and writers in the hotel, and he became very friendly with them. Uh, they, be- they became friends. And then this is so interesting. So Stanley would uh, hang out with his father as his father was moving around the hotel. And he- here he is saying, 
When I was a child, I met these people like composer and writer Virgil Thompson. These people were quirky, someone might say. They had their own distinct ideas and they were interesting people. I loved being around them. So I just think like, what a what an interesting life to have. That, to that be. would be amazing. Yeah. yeah. It's so odd. And then your art, your craft is is running this madhouse. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, yeah. you could feel, I, I could imagine that, you know, if some, some people come out of there, you know, a lot of the people who are living there who would later become legends, you know, as Patty Smith kind of says, it would be interesting to see somebody and, and kind of note that they were talented. And then a little later on, you, you know, you read about them in a newspaper or something like that. It would be, it would feel like a, uh, you had a role to play in culture almost if you were fostering this environment, even in a very hands-off kind of way. It's really, it's really cool. Well, that's what we need. Sometimes you just sometimes need space and to Mm -hmm. not have to worry too much about the rent. Yeah. I'm sure they, they kept the lights on and mostly, you know, but yeah. And I can attest from being, I've I've only been in one room there and that's uh, Gerald's huge windows. I mean, the ceilings, they must be like 13 feet high. He's built a loft bed for himself in there and it, it has space above it. It just, it, it, it feels like a loft space. Um, And uh, on the 10th floor, beautiful views to the South, all of, you know, lower Manhattan. It's, it's, it's a, yeah. Gorgeous light. (laughs) All right. Well, I want to kind of bring us on home before I do. uh, Michael, where can people find you? Right. So, um, I don't know. I guess I'm active on <laughs> Twitter to some extent. We're dragging we have you a... onto Twitter as much as we yeah, can. Michael. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, everything's just tied to my name. So, the best part is to uh, to know how to spell my last name. That's B-A-K-K-E-N-S-E-N. So, if you do Michael Backinson, you'll find me on Twitter. You'll find me on Instagram. Um, I just put out... Uh, my latest collaboration of an audio book um, called the, um, the fallen angels of Karnataka with Hans M. Hershey. It's the fourth book I've done of his. He's a, an author from um, Europe that I've been collaborating with and uh, put out a album in the fall uh, called circle kiss. So you can find me on, but well, you can go to Apple and you can buy my thing or, <laughs> or you can stream it. It's a great, it's a great album. Buy it. Oh, appreciate that. Thank yeah. you. On Art of Darkness too. Yeah, mm-hmm. at exactly. Artofdarkpod.com and mm-hmm. uh, on the Patreon, which we're going to do yeah. shortly about this man who lived to be 112 years old and wow. how he's stuck in the Chelsea Hotel and there would be no getting rid of him. Uh, and Michael, uh, I just want to thank you for your time and you bet. Uh, your, your sort of generous insights and the personal touch to this really added something. Uh, I hope you'll join our telegram too. We've got a little telegram channel, cool. like 20 or 30 people in there. Yeah, I don't know the uh, first thing about that. I've, uh, literally heard references to this. <laughs> I'm behind the it's, times. It's, it's like a it's big like chat a room. WhatsApp. It's like a chat room. Yeah. It's like a chat okay, room. Okay. Cool. Yeah. It's a big, big yeah. chat room. It's fun. Yeah. Um, and of course, everybody who's listening to this uh, is welcome to, to check that out too. Um, and I'm just going to read us out with a little bit about what's happening now to the Hotel Chelsea. Uh, and who knows, maybe in a few years we come back on again. And uh, who knows, maybe even we do, we might even record an episode in, uh, in <laughs> one of these rooms. Um, on June 18th, 2007, the hotel's board of directors ousted Bard as the hotel's manager. Dr. Marlene Kraus, the daughter of Julius Kraus, and David Elder, the grandson of Joseph Gross, and the son of playwright and screenwriter Lon Elder III, replaced Stanley Bard with the management company BD Hotels New York. The firm has since been terminated as well. The hotel was sold to real estate developer Joseph Chetrit for $80 million in 2011 and stopped taking reservations for new guests to begin reservations, uh, renovations, excuse me. Longtime residents were allowed to remain in the building, some of them protected by state rent regulations. New York has very aggressive uh, uh, rent protection. Uh, renters are protected in New York uh, a great deal. The renovators prompted complaints to the city uh, by the remaining tenants of health hazards caused by the construction. The city's building department investigated these complaints and found no major violations. In November 2011, the management ordered all of the hotel's many artworks taken off the walls. 
supposedly for their protection and cataloging, a move which some tenants interpreted it as a step toward forcing them out as well. So the tenants yeah. related to the paintings on the wall, that's, that's, that's heartbreaking. That's, uh, that's a fast. That's yeah. quite moving. Yeah, In 2013, Ed Sheets became the Chelsea Hotel's new owner after buying back five properties from Chetrit and David Bistricker. So this is how these co-ops work, right? Like they're chopped to pieces and you have to have controlling interest in a certain number of the units. It's all very sort mm-hmm. of um, uh, involved. So there are a few more names here. Uh, Ira Drucker, Richard Bourne, and Sean McPherson bought the Chelsea. Located in the Chelsea since 1930 is the restaurant El Quixote, which Burroughs drank at, uh, which was owned by the same family until 2017 when it was sold to the new owner of the hotel. Hmm. In late March 2018, the eatery uh, also closed for renovations. Now, this is interesting. we got a few more minutes to go here. In February 2022, Hotel Chelsea and El Quixote quietly reopened. Uh, is that just, true, just Michael? last month. Yeah, I, I had thought, well, a lot of stuff around 23rd and around the Times Square area, it seemed like things had closed. I mean, things were boarded up. But I think it was just, uh, you know, a COVID thing. So as COVID went away, places that I thought were closed uh, have opened up. And in fact, Gerald confirmed that the Quixote is back in business. Nice. Um, he said it's a little expensive, but, you know, if you want to go in and grab a drink at the bar, you could, you know, do something like that. Um, well, that I did want to add one little... my next New York City yeah. visit. Next time I'm there, I'm, I'm hitting that place up for sure. I did want to add one more little story about Robert Maplethorpe and, and Patty Smith in relation to El Quixote. They would go in there and they would watch and make sure if somebody ordered paella or lobster, they would get the bus boy to give them the leftover shells so that they could make, um, they could make necklaces out of them. <laughs> That's charming. They were just kids, weren't they? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Absolutely. That's awesome. I love that. And that's the episode on the Chelsea Hotel. Woo! Woo! And you know what? I don't nice even work, know. Uh, what could you... I can't ask you the classic Art of Darkness question, Brad, which... Yeah. But maybe I can, because if we think about this place as having a soul, mm-hmm. I'm going to ask... I'm going to ask Michael first, and then I'm going to ask you, Brad. So the, the second question we always ask is, if the Chelsea Hotel was alive today, <laughs> it sounds like it's just come back to life, yeah. what would it be doing? What, what happens to the hotel <laughs> that's a very, next? That's a very abstract Meta. question. I like yeah. it. What, ha- yeah. what happens to the hotel next? Are you optimistic or do you think it just gets completely consumed by the inevitable force of techno capital turning everything into uh, one of these neoliberal looking McDonald's? Honestly, I feel like it's putting up a good fight. And I can say, having been there a couple of days ago, the staff is terrific. And like, they're just normal people. They have not stripped it so that it doesn't, it still has its character. It just feels a little sanitized from how it was. But uh, they haven't like pulled off all the one, wonderful wooden work. You know, it, it still has its bones. Uh, in, in all ways. Doesn't look um, like a holiday in in Omaha. So I, I, I hope that it, I hope that it can kind of like descend into that wonderful bohemian fat house again, because <laughs> I think that that's when it was happiest. So I don't know. Mm. I, I'm an optimist. <laughs> yeah. What do you think, Brad? What I, happens? I, I'm going to be cho- choose to be optimistic too. I, I think there is a, <clears throat> we are in American culture experiencing a, a kind of uh, flattening and a move towards sort of frictionless where, where, you know, things are, things are designed to look the same, uh, you know, everything kind of, there's a, there's a, there's a sameness to everything that kind of, what do they call that? The international architectural style and, and the move towards, you know, even in people's homes, but just kind of painting everything, this similar shades of gray and beige. Uh, I want to believe there's holdouts against the sort of, you know, borgification of, of things. Right. And if the Chelsea Hotel, who's, I mean, what's, what's got a better, what's got a better ch- chance of fighting that than the Chelsea Hotel? So I'm going to be optimistic. And I'm going to echo your optimism with a little bit of macro pessimism uh, <laughs> because th- the bad times that we feel may be coming 
the the economic situation that we're going through, the disruption of the global order. This isn't a political podcast, but I think we can all feel things are teetering on the edge. Mm-hmm. Patty Smith and Company, they they there were nights they didn't eat, mm-hmm. and I'm not saying that we want to lean into this whole idea of the starving artist and and right. all the rest of it, right. but there is a rough and raw and make do quality that corresponds with a lot of this bohemianism and mm-hmm. this wild make do with what you can culture. And mm-hmm. so we may be forced into a situation where we have to band together in these kind of unruly, unusual tribes uh, because the credit cards stop working. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so something to think about. And this is from the New York post uh, after years of widely reported intrigue and uncertainty, the famil- fabled former haunt of Andy Warhol, Jack Kerouac, and scores of New York artists, filmmakers, mu- musicians, and all stripes of zany characters quietly checked back in this month. I want you to hear this. Two more pairs, because this is, this is giving me a little bit of hope. Behind a mess of black construction nets, the Chelsea is already taking bookings for two floors of guest rooms, which we discovered when we popped into the atmospheric lobby that's hidden under a sidewalk construction bridge. <laughs> The digs are offered at bargain rates for now. The hotel's website says, as Hotel Chelsea emerges from rehab, we are offering a few rooms at hard hat rates to guests willing to tolerate a little construction. <laughs> hard hat so rates. Knows, man, That's nice. Maybe the next, yeah. you know, the next uh, great uh, song is going to be written by somebody who, uh, you know, meets meets a gal in the elevator because all the buttons got pushed by a bunch of workmen. Yeah. And Twenty years <laughs> from now, maybe they'll be podcasting about that. So. I believe. I believe. All right, boys, uh, we are going to pick this up on the After Dark. Get that uh, patreoncom slash Pod. Michael Backinson, Brad Kelly, Chelsea Thank Hotel. You. This was a lot of fun. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, guys. That was amazing. cheers, all. All right.